For how influential it's proved to be, Amnesia is a very, very weird series. I don't mean the games themselves, though those are plenty unusual in their own right, but I mean the production of the series itself. See, with most video game series, you have a successful first entry, followed by probably around two sequels that generally get more and more press and accolades before things eventually either wrap up or fall off a cliff if you make too many installments. Purists will probably always prefer the first one, but I think that video games are unique in the world of media, where sequels tend to be more successful or well received than the original up to a certain point. This isn't always true, of course, but in general it's the case. But the trajectory of the Amnesia series doesn't look like that at all. As far as fan reactions are concerned, I'd say the series is considered great, bad, okay, great. Why is this, though? The first Amnesia game, Amnesia The Dark Descent, was an absolute smash hate with fictional games when it released in 2010. It's hard to overstate the influence of The Dark Descent. I mean, the game launched some of the most lucrative creator careers ever, redefined entire genres of YouTube content, inspired dozens of copycat games. I mean, without The Dark Descent, this type of YouTube video you're watching right now, a weird guy talking to you about a video game, might not even exist, but that's a video for another day. The series has been surprisingly stagnant since then though, with four games in 10 years. Frictional did do a fantastic job breathing new life into the franchise with Amnesia The Bunker that came out earlier this year, which fans mostly agree was a phenomenal survival horror experience. I love The Bunker and uh, you should uh, you should totally watch my video about it. But The Bunker wouldn't have been a redemption for the series if the developers hadn't first strayed from the light in the first place. And I think for most people, the culprit of this blame would certainly be the second installment in the series, 2013's Amnesia A Machine for Pigs. People were not very hot on this game when it came out. I mean, game journalist reviewers lavished a good bit of praise on it, but at the same time, Amnesia Machine for Pigs was the type of game you might be accused of being an uncultured swine for not liking, so that makes sense. Also, this is 2013, probably one of the periods in gaming history when game journalists and the unwashed gamer masses were most at odds with each other. This was after all right on the eve of Gamergate, a word that I hope, dear viewer, for your sake you haven't heard in a very, very long time. One important thing to note is that although Frictional produced and released the game, it was developed by British developer The Chinese Room. Frictional had their hands full with developing Soma and trusted The Chinese Room to bring the second Amnesia game to life, even though their company's name sounds like a racially dubious attraction at a boardwalk amusement park. The Chinese Room had won both renown and flack for their earlier game Dear Esther. Though many game journalists loved its contemplative mood and storytelling, it mostly attracted attention by being one of the main examples of the much derided genre of walking simulator, plot-driven games with very little interactivity. I don't think my own thoughts about Dear Esther matter here, but all this is to say Amnesia of Machine for Pigs posed a problem as a much-anticipated sequel of a very successful game outsourced to an outside and, for some, controversial developer. Although I know some gamers that genuinely despise a Machine for Pigs, I'd say the general reaction would be disappointment or confusion. Disappointment with the game itself or confusion on why the game was so different from the original. This is reflected on Steam user reviews, where the game's reviews are mostly considered mixed. Though a minority are positive, and in fact some of the negative reviews do praise the game's mood and sound design, the majority consensus at the time was that Amnesia Machine for Pigs was a letdown. This negative attention seems to continue into the present day. Look at how the fantastic YouTuber Mandalore Gaming talks about Machine for Pigs in a video from a month back. Bunker came out a while back, and I've heard a lot of good things. It also made me realize that I haven't played an Amnesia game since a Machine for Pigs. I've gone back to Penumbra, The Dark Descent, Soma, but a Machine for Pigs left some kind of brain block in me. A Machine for Pigs has largely become forgotten, and when it's remembered, it's essentially a byword for lost potential, and it seems Frictional Games is more than happy to pretend it doesn't exist. Which is why we are here today. As of recording, A Machine for Pigs, which came out on New Year's Eve 2013, is approaching its 10th birthday. A whole decade has come and gone since it hit the shelves. Now, I've personally never played Machine for Pigs, never seen a playthrough or a video essay on it. I've just taken for granted the bits and pieces of critiques I've heard about the game over the years. But after a decade, I think the game deserves another shot. And that's what I'm doing today. Diving into a machine for pigs on its own terms. Not as a sequel to The Dark Descent, not as another reviled walking simulator, but as a game that its creators must have cared about and loved. This video will be an unbiased retrospective look at Machine for Pigs. Now, actually, to be completely honest with you, I'm not unbiased. I like to root for the underdog. Part of me wants to like this game. Part of me wants to shout from the mountaintop that this is actually an unappreciated and misunderstood gem. The game begins with us awakening from a nightmare in an opulent bedroom, though eerily the bed itself is enclosed in a cage. Stricken with amnesia, we play as Oswald Mandis, a wealthy industrialist who made his fortune in the meat processing industry and whose spookily still mansion we are now in. A nearby room reveals that your beloved wife Lily died giving birth to your twin sons, Edwin and Enoch, who are now calling out to you to come find them in the attic. It's a very effective start to a gothic tale. The dead wife, the lonely mansion of Washington rain, the unseen ghostly children. Now, you can probably tell the graphics aren't great, even for 2013. I mean, this year had The Last of Us and Bioshock Infinite, and even this masterpiece. Try University of Texas. Gone a pro if I hadn't the name. But I mean, hey, amazing graphics aren't needed as long as the design is decent. And I think that's very true. Although the surfaces and textures of Manus's mansion are a bit flat and wonky, like what in the world is going on behind these windows, the atmosphere of the level is just perfect. I love the plush-looking furniture and curtains, the stuffed animals, and the warm orange glow of the chandelier. Other small graphical choices show an attention to detail and a love for the setting, like the moth flying around under the street lamp, and especially the paintings. Mandis has great taste in art. There are some truly fantastic paintings here from the likes of Rembrandt, Bosch, Bruegel, and Anton Weertz. 
You may have heard of the first three, but maybe not the latter. Antoine Weirch was a Belgian painter of the first half of the 19th century, many of whose most famous works dwell in the world of the Gothic and Grotesque. This painting specifically that Madness has hanging up, Hunger, Madness, Crime, is featured prominently and is especially significant thematically, which we'll come back to later. Just don't question why Madness has like four copies of it hanging up. Anyways, we follow the voices of our sons into the attic, though they continue to elude us. Throughout all this, thunderous rumblings shake your house, and you'll occasionally catch a glimpse of a mysterious figure running from you in the shadows, not to mention those odd painted pig masks you find in every room. Eventually, you wander into your study, get a call from a mysterious voice, and discover a secret passage that takes you into the walls of your house, where you can peer through the paintings, which are actually windows. According to a journal entry, this is where you used to retreat to cry over your wife's loss and, uh, watch her take baths? Oh, Oswald, you old fucking creepy weirdo, you. Anyways, as you continue to explore, you find a phonograph that plays a conversation between you and a man called Professor A that a note reveals has come to pry into your seemingly crumbling mental state. In the recordings, Professor A marvels that despite what he's gone through, Mandis has achieved so much in the world of business and philanthropy. The mysterious voice calls again, warning us that our children are trapped below the machine and that they are in danger of being drowned by some biblical level flood. But then who are the kids we've been seeing and hearing in the house? Also, why does the voice sound so much like our own? Anyways, now we have our first quest, restarting the machine's engine. We travel through a number of increasingly industrial settings in search of our children, solving mostly fairly basic puzzles. More notes allude to some sort of epiphany we had when visiting Aztec ruins in Mexico, as well as other notes vaguely referencing mysterious potent chemicals and ways to transcend human evolution. The notes we find are one of the three main ways we obtain information in the game, the other being journal notes that fill up as we explore that typically give a light nudge on how to solve a puzzle or an observation on the atmosphere. These often use some pretty heavy prose, some of which can be as purple as a certain FNAF villain. Now I can see people finding this pretentious, but I really don't have a problem with it. If you watch some of my other videos, you know I'm a big reader, and I do find the often ornate writing style welcome and appropriate here. After all, the Chinese room are trying to craft a gothic story, and most of the gothic classics are as dense and exclamation mark packed as the text you'd send a girl you're in love with when you've been drinking and are ready to risk it all. Plus, the highfalutin style fits what we know of Madness as a character. I mean, he's a self-made industrialist who lives in a manor crammed with old master's paintings. The dude clearly thinks a lot of himself. I also love how much of a hero he depicts himself in the journal entries, comparing himself to Daniel and Moses from the Bible. Later on, this post-amnesia Madness starts to seriously clash with what we know about pre-amnesia Madness. Sometimes the writing style is too much even for me, but it takes more than that for me to write off a game as pretentious. The other way you get more info in the game is through the mysterious voice on the telephone, who essentially guides you through the levels while reminding you how much in danger your children are. At some point, he mentions that someone is just ahead of you sabotaging the machinery of the plant and implores you to undo the damage he's caused to reverse the flood and save your children. Often the saboteur is just two steps ahead of you, and Manus' journal shows the mental battle he feels he's waging with the unseen antagonist. As we advance, we eventually arrive at a churchyard, and I just love the atmosphere here. This is exactly what I mean by the team still crafting beautiful scenes despite graphical shortcomings. The enormous glowing moon floating above the fog, the orange throb of the street lamps, the eerie silhouette of the gothic steeple against the soaring smokestacks of the factory. The church and the factory are wonderfully gothic contrasts of the past and future. History versus modernity, form versus function. Inside the church, the mood continues. There's not a whole lot of music in this game, but when it's used, it's used very purposefully and often a great effect. The church itself is an absolute highlight of the game for me. It initially seems slightly cozy, albeit in an eerie way, but on closer inspection, things are deeply wrong. The statues of the Virgin Mary have the face and teats of a sow, the carcasses of hogs lay across the altar, and the stained glass bears images of machinery and a pig-faced redeemer. The church is literally built into the foundation of the factory. In fact, it seems to be the mouth leading to the belly of the beast. Notes in the church from its previous vicar reveal that the poor congregation saw Manus as a kind of god since his return from Mexico. And in another note, Preamnesia Manus ominously claims that the father has joined his flock in the holding pens. It's not long before we find the reference holding pens in the church's basement. This is the point when the true horror game elements begin in earnest, as a squealing, half-hog, half-human creature chases us through the church basement. When we escape, we find ourselves in a moonlit courtyard, with the entrance to the factory itself right before us. Here is another wonderful outdoor scene where the sound design really carries. In a way, it's our last moments of peace before we truly descend into hell, and it feels like they really put love into crafting it. Inside the Mandis processing plant, we get another recorder that plays dialogue between Mandis and the Professor. In it, Mandis bemoans the fact that the masses still take so much comfort from a belief in heaven after death as, with some serious sacrifice, paradise on earth is possible now. We load up the coal furnaces and turn them back on to get the sabotaged pistons back in order, and avoid another pig man stalking us in the shadows. Now so far, all I'd described I'd played in one sitting over the course of an hour or so, and something sort of odd had been happening. The only real game mechanic is walking through levels that are linear in every sense of the word. The puzzles are laughably simple with no brain work required besides pulling levers and dragging one thing from somewhere to put it in something else. The scares have been mostly light and choreographed. In theory, I should have felt frustrated and unengaged, but I didn't. 
In fact, through this whole first hour, I ended up having a lot of fun, despite how little engagement or actual gameplay was involved. At the time, I wasn't sure why, but I think it was genuinely a feeling of strong, authentic interest in the setting and the power of the atmosphere. I felt like I was going on a journey, pulling on a thread that led me through well-realized locations. I feel like during this hour, I got the appeal of the walking simulator, where I wasn't annoyed by the lack of mechanics, but rather intrigued by the journey itself. Now, to be completely honest, unfortunately, this feeling did not continue, and the rest of my time with Amnesia Machine for Pigs did not have the same sense of fun and intrigue. The feeling of a journey is replaced by a slog through poorly lit industrial areas and subterranean zones. Though the story gets more realized, you feel less like a navigator and more like a passenger. And that honestly made me feel pretty sad, because until then, I had fallen under a Machine for Pigs spell. Anyways, the second act of the game is mostly just trying to repower the other parts of the machine after they've been struck by the saboteur. You find out a lot more about the story and the context of everything you're seeing within the factory. The way this story unfolds is honestly pretty clever and cool. The majority of it is gathered from notes, but these are often out of chronological order, so it does take a lot of piecing together on your own part. Before the game's events, Mandis' wife died in childbirth to his twins, splitting him between joy at his sons and resentment that their birth ended the life of their beloved mother. Later, Mandis, fascinated by the ancient Aztecs, visited Mexico with his son, where something unknown but disastrous happened and Mandis returned to England as a changed man. Although he earned the respect of society due to his business success and charitable behaviors, something odd was happening below the surface, which, as you encounter more ominous notes about horrible transformations and encounters with the pigmen, become increasingly clear. Mandis was incensed by what he saw as the corrupt nature of society and the divide in living conditions between the poor and the rich, which he believed would only lead to more disaster, and takes it upon himself to fix. So you have a bunch of poor people struggling to feed themselves and a couple of very, very wealthy people at the top that are keeping them down. Well, Mandis figured out a way for there to be a lot less rich people while also making sure the poor people had plenty to eat. All it took to make this happen was to slightly change the type of animals that were being fed into the machine. But who could he possibly find that would agree to work these machines? Well, Mandis got the genius idea to breed a new race of pig-human drudges by experimenting on poor people from asylums, poor houses, and orphanages using experimental chemicals. So in a way, it is a classic Robin Hood story. Steal from the rich, give to the poor, while also forcibly turning the poor into poor sign abominations to endlessly toil at your cannibalistic meat factory. If I chop you up in a meat grinder, and the only thing that comes out that's left of you is your eyeball, you're, you're probably dead. You're probably going to, not you, I'm just saying, like. Mandis hates established religion and sees it as unfair to the poor masses, instead believing that they should worship a being incapable of human feelings. The machine itself has become a god for the pigmen, a god they serve unquestioningly. The religious allusions are really interesting here. There's a cataclysmic flood and plenty of references to biblical figures. Though Mandis, aka the machine, cannot create life as you expect a god to do. They can only pervert and corrupt it. And let's not forget that the god of the Bible sent a flood, whereas Mandis is trying to stop one. Anyways, the story is surprisingly grim and very interesting. Eat the Rich has become a Twitter tagline, but here we actually see Mandis trying to put it into motion. A sort of reverse of Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. Mandis clearly sees himself as a savior who can unshackle Victorian England from the industrial capitalism where the poor constantly have a knife to their throats while the rich minority gets richer and richer. But somehow he himself can't see that turning some of the poor majority into hideous pig creatures that will live as slaves for the rest of their lives isn't exactly justice to the working class. Also, doesn't it seem a bit off-brand? Sure, Mandis is a weirdo, what with the journal entries where he describes himself as some epic hero when really he just running around in sewers flipping switches and secretly watching his wife take a bath, but this seems a bit much. I mean, he doesn't seem like an evil person. At the very least, he's a good dad, right? Anyways, Act 3 is mostly pretty uninteresting from a gameplay perspective. There are some highlights though. I love when we finally travel through the where the pig monsters live. Classical music plays on loop to calm them, and we see them congregating around a dinner table or playing with blocks alone in their rooms. Though horrific, the pigmen do have a certain childish innocence about them, which makes the fact that they were all originally humans all the more tragic. There are really only two or three pigmen models, and at this point of the game we've seen them so many times that they aren't really scary anymore, so the decision to humanize them at this point, instead of still expecting us to vacate our bowels when we see them, is a good choice by the Chinese room. Anyways, eventually we finally arrive at the heart of the machine, which is this monstrous steampunk construction of pipes and valves suspended above the abyss. Now's the time to finally thwart the saboteur and restart the machine. Once you restart it, the voice you've been hearing on the telephone reveals itself as the machine itself, the machine you just brought back to life. I live. I breathe again. I rise. I will rise to bleach the sky and still the water. I will spin the world wheel and set the future upon the path to redemption. In the twist of the century, it turns out your children weren't actually being held underground. You see a vision of the two of them ripping their own hearts out before awakening. Manus realizes he himself was the sabbatuer before he was stricken with amnesia, and sees his only hope of redemption to repeat his work to thwart the machine, even if it cost him his life. I don't know, man. Anybody who had been reading the notes up to this point knows that the machine is a bad thing, so this isn't too much of a shock, though the reveal that Manus himself was a saboteur is pretty cool. Essentially, Manus' soul was split in two at some point, maybe when his wife died in childbirth, maybe on his trip to Mexico. The evil, resentful part of his soul took up a new life powering the machine itself. Manus, or part of him, was the architect of the machine all along, and once it was completed, that part of him became the machine itself. 
It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and it is a bit unsatisfying, but it does at least thematically fit with the subject matter and setting. The gothic fiction that inspired a machine for pigs was filled with doubles and doppelgangers to explore the hidden, repressed parts of the human soul. This was the era of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, after all. Did it hurt to carve out the fevered flesh? Did it hurt to cut free the gangrenous foot? Ask instead this. Can we save them? When did I say that? That is not me. That is not me! Anyways, Mandis resumes his sabotaging, all the while arguing with the voice of the machine and asking where his children are, which the machine implies Mandis himself should know. We learn we are too late to truly stop the machine. Remember that the game is set on New Year's Eve 1899, and as soon as the 20th century is entered, the machine's plan was to let loose hundreds of pigmen on the London streets, where they wreak havoc and presumably abduct more of the rich to get turned into human spam. These scenes where you merge onto the city streets to find the pigmen rampaging could have been an incredible set piece, especially since I've been praising the outdoor scenes this whole time, but it honestly left me somewhat cold. The city feels completely empty and the pigmen look more cute than menacing as they trot around in the street. We don't even really see anybody, besides this one random corpse on the street, although the fact that he is extremely cheeked up is kind of nice. The sound design tries its best to carry with sounds of chaos and shrieking, creepy choir music and snorts of pigmen, but it all feels empty. I wish they'd either made this section feel more real and urgent or just change it entirely. Eventually, we travel from the machine back to our house, right back where we started. The pigmen have already claimed the house is theirs. I guess now we know what those cages on the bed from the beginning are for. It's also revealed that we killed the professor we've been talking to in the phonograph recordings. Again, we find the specters of our children who repeat the same gesture of ripping out their hearts and are teleported to what seems like a sewer line of blood. At this point, the game throws more monologues at you than a Dan Flanagan Netflix original. It feels like Madness is in a monologue off with the machine, and whoever uses more colorful language wins. I usually don't love monologues, but some of these are genuinely pretty awesome. As we travel into the heart of the machine, it's revealed who really killed our children. But why did you take my children? I, Mandus, of all the blood we have spilled together, the first drops fell from your hands alone. Then I am damned for a filicide, and everything is lost. I think most players could have predicted this development at this point, but we're left asking what could possibly compelled Mandus to kill his two children, the beloved twins that he's been traveling deeper and deeper into hell all night to save. In the heart of the machine, there's some boss fights with an electro pig creature that hunts you by teleporting around until you flip a switch. The electro pig does look pretty cool, and these do break up the monotony, but they're not too interesting. Plus, at this point, I was so interested in figuring out what was happening that the gameplay interruptions were less welcome as they might have been in Act 2. Eventually, you teleport to the inner chamber of the machine, where you find the corpse of the professor being used to power the machinery. The machine begins to implore Manus to spare it, comparing its mission with her own, before finally revealing what actually happened to Manus' children. I did not kill your children, Mantis. You sacrificed them on the temple steps, knowing what the coming century would do to them. Your sons will drown, lungs full of mud and shrapnel on the banks of the Song. You wanted to save them from the horror to come. That is the vision we shared. Everything we have built to avert this coming nightmare. Something Mandis found in Mexico, likely the egg-shaped artifact the game frequently mentions, allowed Mandis to see what would happen to his sons in the future. He chose to end their lives on his terms, rather than let the world end them on its own. And I'm reminded of that painting I mentioned by Antoine Weirtz that Mandis has hanging up in his home. At first glance, we see a woman crouched on the ground with a look of madness in her eyes. If we look closer, though, we see the mutilated bodies of her two little ones, one of which is cooking in the fire, and the other is nestled in her lap. Her smile is horrifying, but we notice that she's refusing to look at the bodies of her children. Manus was the same way, and if we looked at the paintings we might have known all along. He's killed his darling children as well, though he refuses to see it. We'll never know why the woman in the painting killed her children, but we know why Manus did. He sacrificed them to save them from the suffering the world would bring. And I think sacrifice is the theme of the game. Not the Industrial Revolution, Capitalism, or the Class Divide. Manus is horrified of the future, of what the world will hold. He's seen into it through some supernatural means, and it's broken his mind. That moment was truly what split his consciousness in two. Just as he sacrificed his sons to save them from their own violent deaths in World War I, he's willing to sacrifice thousands to save the world from the carnage the 20th century will bring. But who is he to decide that sacrifice is better than suffering? The right thing to do would be to raise his sons and spend as much time with them as he could until he sent them away to their deaths. Who knows the moments of joy and growth he'd experience over their short lives? Maybe that would make their wartime deaths worth it. He wants to liberate the poor from the exploitation of the rich, but he doesn't know the moments of private happiness and freedom they might experience in their own lives. Think about the Aztecs that he was so obsessed with, the poster practitioners of human sacrifice. There's a wonderful quote where Mandis tells his sons, No, my darlings, they most certainly were not savage. You see, they believed that the sky could fall on their heads, and they truly believed that offering blood was the only way of stopping this from happening. I love this quote because it shows the Aztecs not as depraved or bloodthirsty, but rather as people so concerned with keeping humanity alive and safe that they would commit horrible things for it. 
and when you finally see the machine rising up before you, it almost looks like an Aztec pyramid. The same pyramids that priests would send the bodies of sacrificial victims tumbling down after ripping out their hearts. Even the first quote that the machine tells you on the phone, precious eagle cactus fruit. Isn't there something that that one kid who thought being random was hilarious in middle school would make his username on AIM, but was actually the name the Aztecs gave to sacrificial victims' hearts? But let's not forget the action that Manus' children, who were killed in Aztec pyramid, repeat. And how do these two settings relate to each other? The Aztec Empire and Victorian London. Both were massive metropolises and military superpowers with highly stratified social classes. Both were willing to sacrifice their people to keep their precarious society moving. The Aztecs on temple steps and the Victorians in factories, slums, and poorhouses. But sacrifice isn't always noble or even right, which I think is what the game wants you to realize. Suffering is not always a punishment that must be avoided or thwarting. A difficult life, a bloody life, a life cut short by violence is still a life worth living. Anyways, as you walk the steps of the temple you've constructed, the machine confronts you with one of the best instances of video game writing I've experienced, imploring you to redeem society and avoid the horrors of the 20th century, referencing the Holocaust, the destruction of Hiroshima, the Khmer Rouge genocide. Even listening to it now while I'm writing this gives me goosebumps. I have dug trenches for the refugees. I have murdered dissidents where the ground never thaws and starved the masses into fame. A child's shadow burnt into the brickwork. A house of skulls in the jungle. The innocent, the innocent Mandus trod and bled and gassed and starved and beaten and murdered and enslaved. This is your coming century. They will eat the Mandus. They will make pigs of you all and they will bury their snaps into your ribs. The machine is referencing a historical phenomenon called the fin de siècle, a period at the end of the 19th century of anxiety at what the next century would hold. It was seen as a time of fear, degeneracy, pessimism, ambivalence. People thought that the growth of technology, industry, and materialism would lead to the end of the world in the coming century, and in a way they were right. If we ignore pandemics and plagues, the 20th century was the worst one the human race has ever seen. It's a marvel we survived. Say what you will about the Chinese room, but the fact that they chose to base their horror game around this weird historical concept is frankly kind of amazing. As extreme as Manus' plan was, everything he seeks to save humanity from were the concerns that actual people in the time period had. Anyways, Manus makes his way to the top of the pyramid and takes his place atop the god he created. Despite the machine's protests, he gives his life to shut down the machine and avoid his own plan for the world. He fires off one last awesome monologue, and we see the gates of the Manus plant close. On New Year's Day, the world sleeps peacefully, but leaves one eye open for the century to come. So I guess it's post-mortem time. Honestly, I basically agree with most of the major criticisms. The story and mood are fantastic, but it feels, much like man to sacrifice his own children, that the Chinese room sacrificed gameplay to tell a good story. Why is there not a single cool puzzle? Like, we don't need inventory management or anything crazy, but even just solving a riddle puzzle or two, or something where we could use critical thinking, would have made a huge difference and surely wouldn't have been too hard to implement. Everything is basically just dragging and dropping objects that don't even really have any gravity. It's such a devolution from the first game and all the puzzles fit like an afterthought. The level design is painfully linear. As soon as you see a branching path, you know that one side will have progression and one side will be empty besides a document to read. There are no choices to make, and perhaps the biggest crime an amnesia title can commit, it's not even scary. I am by no means brave in games like this, but I think I might have jumped once or twice during my time playing a game from one of the true died in the wool horror franchises. Like yes, the atmosphere is tense and amazing, but this might be one horror game that doesn't have enough jump scares. Or no, that's not really true. It tries to scare you, but it just kind of fails sometimes. One realization I had about this game is that it feels like the anti The Dark Descent. The powerless, horrified feeling that the Dark Descent does so well, the feeling that a poor raccoon must feel when it actually wanders into the zoo enclosure filled with murderous chimps must feel. And the biggest difference is that, in my opinion, A Machine for Pigs is horrible for Let's Plays. I feel like all its charm would wear off if you weren't the one in the driver's seat. It's almost like they were purposely trying to break from the winning formula Frictional Games had. But despite all that, I think I might have loved this game. It's boring, it's confusing, it's pretentious, it's a walking sim, but it's a journey. A journey that takes you through some of the most atmospheric and painterly levels I've ever experienced in a horror game. A journey through two civilizations' history and societal baggage. A journey that makes you ask yourself how far you'd go to save the world. There's just too many things this game does well to allow me to write it off. But all the things I loved about it are so hard to quantify and pin down. It's more about the feeling the game gave me. I was left asking whether A Machine for Pigs deserves to be a game. If the amazing things about the game are the story and atmosphere, couldn't it work just as well in a movie or perhaps even better a novel? But I think the question is pretty disrespectful to the creators, to be honest. They wanted to make this story as a game, and that's what they did. So how bad was Amnesia Machine for Pigs after a decade? Well, it wasn't. In fact, for all its failings and frustrations, parts of this game were genius and deserved to be remembered and enjoyed for what they were. I don't want the story that Machine for Pigs tells to be forgotten, even if I'm not sure if its gameplay deserves to be remembered. 
If I was a developer at the Chinese Room, I'd look back on it fondly as a truly unique and so un-video gamesy story brought to life through the exploration horror medium. And I think of all people, frictional games should remember it, both for its failings but also for its strengths as they hopefully cook up an excellent successor to Amnesia the Bunker. Anyways, that's all for today. Thank you so much for your time, dear viewer. I wish you all the good fortune in the world. I remain your faithful snuggler. <laughs>